Greetings, greetings, greetings. This is Anthony Canary. And welcome to Men Speak. And this is a very fast show, this is our first edition. And uh, we're very happy to have you on board. We are going to discuss about manhood. What is manhood? And with us here, we have a gentleman by the name of John Nana, an elder, and we'd like to hear about him and his journey in manhood. Mr. Nana, welcome, sir. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. I'm a man, so I'm yeah. happy to talk about men. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> and um, I'm just over 70 years. Yes. So I've been a man for over 70 years. You've been a man for 70 years. <laughs> <laughs> You've never been any other gender. I know. <laughs> I've never been any, I'm not even ever wanted to be Amen. another like a gender. <laughs> super, super. So super. it's good to discuss with the men. Yes. So that men can hear that God did not make a mistake in creating man. Excellent. But I also want the ladies to listen to us, mm -hmm. to hear we are a gift to them. Hallelujah. And it's important for them to see how critical it is yes. that there is men in their lives. Beautiful. Yes. Well, sir, the floor is yours. Please tell us. Um, I want to say three things yes. with your permission. Yes, sir. Sure. Number one, mm -hmm. masculinity yes. refers mm -hmm. to people who are created to be fathers. Wow. They don't have to be fathers, mm -hmm. but they are created to be fathers. Right. You cannot be masculine yes. without the ability and uh, without 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 that 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 in you that makes you want to father. Right. Sometimes biologically it may not be possible, yes. but you are interested in becoming a father. Yes, you have the urge. Yes. Yes. That becoming a father means you are ready to reproduce yourself. Mm -hmm. That becoming a father means that you are ready to nurture a young one, yes. receive a young one, mm -hmm. and nurture them until they can become adults. Yes. And that fatherhood means you are ready to help these people to be what God wanted them to be. So, so once you say you are masculine, it means you have a desire to father. Number two, once you say you are masculine, you have a desire to lead. Mm -hmm. Something in us, the way we are, we are created, makes men want to lead. Yes, sir. And again, there are three things that you can see in that. That desire to lead is, you know, when, whenever there is a problem, mm -hmm. you are the first to check. Yes. How can we sort it out? Mm -hmm. If there is in your house and there is a bang outside, it's not your way that you run out. Mm -hmm. you, you want to sort it out. Yes. What is this? Yes. It is enough to take risks yes. in order to protect our own. Right. And that's masculinity, that desire. You know, your wife will go behind you. Yes. You you go ahead. Not because the lion can't eat you. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a desire in you to protect her. Yes, sir. That that part of the that's part of this idea of wanting to lead. Mm -hmm. Because you see, you are leading into danger. Yes. But you are still leading. Yes. Number two. If you really have this leadership, leadership thing, not only are you interested in protecting people, you are interested in sorting out their issues. Mm -hmm. So here is a problem with society, with the family, how do you sort it out? So you are the thinker of the family, mm -hmm. you are the visionary of the family, yes. because you are a leader. Yes. And it's an us. Mm -hmm. Whereas others may be busy cooking and thinking about the food they are eating, you ask yourself, but what are we going to eat next week? There's something in you that causes you to be visionary. And that's part of leadership. Right. Thirdly, these aspects of becoming a leader is the one that causes you to want to have interpersonal skills. Know how to communicate with the people, how to listen to people, how to talk to people, how to sell your idea to somebody else. Mm -hmm. It's an interpersonal skill that at least required in leadership and you'll be in your desire. You have the wisdom to know if I talk to my wife at this time, she will be annoyed. Mm -hmm. So you find a way of delaying yes. what you are saying to look for the right timing. Mm -hmm. And by the time you talk, 
she is able to move with you to your vision right. because you have those communication. Those are three things. Yes. You have a desire for fatherhood mm -hmm. to help people, mm -hmm. to help people to grow, yes. to become what God does. You have a desire for for leadership. Yes. You have talked about the the ability to to help people to move. Yes. But thirdly, yes. I think it will be important to understand that if you are a, if you are a, if you are a man, yes. and uh, which you are, it's important to understand that because God created you first, mm -hmm. you feel you are held accountable for the spiritual welfare of your family. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it is in your desire to relate with God one on one. Yes. Of course, people become rebels and refuse. True. But inside you. Since the kind of burden God has given you to lead your family, the kind of risks you have to take are such that you can't tackle them on your own. Yes. And you can't go to the people you are helping to help you. True. You learn to go to God. Because He's the only one who has more power than you, yes. more knowledge than you, yes. and can take bigger risk. And yet, you know, to God there is no risk. Wow. That's so a man yes. who is not having this spiritual angle mm. will look after himself, yes. rely on himself. Mm. And when the problem becomes big, mm. they end up in depression and mental breakdown. Because they never realize God's intention was not for him to take this, this role yes. on his own. Yes. God was willing to help him. Mm -hmm. That's why the instructions in the Garden of Eden were not given to the woman. Yes. They were given to the man. True. No wonder he built there. Yes. Because you need to understand it is referring to a man too. So that's the first thing you must understand. That God wants you to represent your family by handing over his, your problems to him so that he can inspire you on sorting out the issues that are there. Number two, on this spiritual angle, you are not enjoying just going to God because you have many issues. You also enjoy fellowship with Him. Yes. It means you can be lonely, there can be disagreement with your children, disagreement with your wife, they can even disown you, but you have learned how to have fellowship with the God one on one. And because you have learned that, what causes other people loneliness to doing wrong things? Mm -hmm. You have learned that you can spend time with the God and with that, have enough resources to be able to bring reconciliation in a situation that was marred by relationship issues. Right. And it's important to have to know that how important it is. The other day I was talking in a men's conference and telling them a lot of men do not know how valuable that relationship with God is. Mm -hmm. So they end up relying on family altar. Family altar is a time when you as a man and your children, your wife, pray together. Mm -hmm. It's not enough. You need to have the family altar where you are relating with your family, but the kind of language you speak is measured. True. Your children will not understand things. You need another separate time when you are one on one with God. You can tell God exactly where you feel. Then you tell your friend. You tell a friend. But this time you are telling a friend with ability yes. to sort out your issues. Yes. Not just to give you advice, yes. but to sort out your problem. You need to always set a time in, and it's important on a daily basis. When you go before God and tell him, I've messed up. The, I, what I did, what I told my wife, what I told my what I did at work, it was a mess. Lord, forgive me. Sometimes you can't tell anybody because you feel the misunderstanding. But God does not misunderstand you. So that sense of guilt that causes men to be defensive disappears when you go to God and admit what's wrong with you. And that's part of, that's why I was telling men, you must look for a time to be together with you. Number two, it's not just that he sorts out your guilt. You are dealing with the future and you have no clarity. You're able to go to God and say, my child is going to university next year. The kind of school fees he seems to be, what do I do? Mm -hmm. And the that relationship with God takes the bad day about the future such that you're able to hand over to him in prayer. Right. And so that's why this, this time with the God is so important. So you need to understand masculinity requires a personal relationship with God. Yes. Why? He says, mm -hmm. all fatherhood, Ephesians chapter 3, all fatherhood is derived from God. Mm -hmm. And I believe the Bible meant that for you to be a father, 
you are representing for God the Father. That's true. No wonder in the Lord's Prayer we say, Our Father who art in heaven. Meaning what? It's one on earth. Yes. <laughs> you are the God on earth. Yes. You are the Father on earth. Yes. And, and you are supposed to run your fatherhood. Mm. It's drawn from God. Yes. The way God is a father is the way I'm also supposed to be a father. Mm. And I find that quite a challenge. It is. Because I know I, I don't measure up. That's true. But I'm supposed to be his ambassador. Mm. He in my family. Yes. Now, when you understand all that, you can see how complex uh, this fatherhood thing is. Mm. And when people are not given, uh, you can see how many aspects I've talked about. Yes. People push one aspect mm. and forget that aspect. True. And in the process, mm -hmm. you don't become the man God expected you to be. Yes. You don't become the father mm -hmm. God expected you to be. And you don't become the husband God expected to be. Right. And you don't become the societal leader yes. God expected to be. Yes. And all those roles yes. are for the same man. Wow, that's amazing. So you cannot separate manhood with fatherhood. No. They're intertwined. They're intertwined. That's pretty amazing. So, there's a, there's a mantra that goes around about men that a man is about finances, about, a man is about how big his bank account is. <laughs> um, what's your take on that? First of all, money came just the other day. Yes. So what was man? <laughs> <laughs> so, you can see very well, even by the history, yes. it's not a big issue. My yes. grandfather hardly dealt with the money. Yes. And uh, therefore, you cannot, man cannot be defined by money. Mm. However, there's an aspect that is true. Yes. Since man was given wider shoulders mm. than women, mm. can lift more, yes. his major job in a family is to be a provider. Yes. Not the only provider, yes. but the leading provider yes. of the home. Yes. But that does not mean that you, you, you get money. Yes. What they need is food, mm. they need school fees, and it's possible to get those things yes. without money. Yes. For example, if you have a farm, you can, you can, you can farm all your food yes. without necessarily involving money. Yes. So it, we must separate that idea that man is money. Mm. And I have three reasons why I believe it's wrong. Mm. The moment man is seen as money, yes. And your wife start getting earning more. Yes. You're not a man. <laughs> and by the way, you thought it was a joke, but you started believing it. Yes. And because you believe it, it is totally destroys your psychology. Yes. So the moment your wife earns more than you, and one of yes. man is money. Yes. You just start feeling like a girl. And you actually, um, I hope I'm talking to adults, and you actually will go to bed and find yourself. Important. Yes. And it all came from yeah, she's man. earning more. And you told yourself mm. to be a man yes. meant money. Yes. It is a dangerous thing. Man is not about money. So, Number two, why it is a it's a wrong thing. And I'm talking about a man himself. Yes. The wife has said nothing. Yes. The wife has not even complained. Mm -hmm. But you yourself in your psychology, mm. you don't feel a man. Yes. Number two, when if money, if a man is defined with the money. The moment he has no money, he tends to become violent. Yes. Because you see, you do not want issues to be raised. Mm -hmm. So your wife says, where have you come from? Bang, you are beating her. Because you are suffering from, you feel you are not a man. To prove you are a man, you change your identity formula. Now you can see how dangerous. People talk as if it's a joke. Mm -hmm. But once you believe it, you'll be looking for a way of forcing your wife. Yes. Forcing your children yes. to recognize your manhood yes. because you have lost it. And yet you are to believe you are lying. Yes. Thirdly, if you believe man is money, then you start thinking the only thing required for me is provision. Mm -hmm. So you buy your wife a car, mm -hmm. you buy her a house, yes. your children are going to the best schools, yes. then you disappear and start walking around with the dogodogos and ch to chungwas. Because for you, I, in, and men ask, what do you even want? I've given everything. Because you thought, monomony, Pesa. Pesa. Yes. You thought it's money. Yes. So you can see that gospel mm. is a destructive gospel and biblical. 
Let me give you three reasons why. Yes. I've given you three reasons why it's a wrong one. Yes. Let me give you three reasons why it's better to see yourself the way God sees you. Yes. And I told you, he sees you as a father, he sees you as a leader, and he sees you as a worship leader. Yes. When you see yourself that way, you see a wider thing. You look at your wife, and you see her spiritual side, you see her physical side, you see her social side, and you try to help her in all the areas. Mm -hmm. Not just money. Yes. It means that even when you, your money is less, mm -hmm. and you have no, she will still need you. Yes. Because your job was not just provision. So when she starts earning more, it will not affect your relationship. Why? She needs you. Mm -hmm. She has seen how soci sociologically you support her. Yes. She has seen how spiritually you support her. You, she is a close friend and will miss you. Mm -hmm. Whether you give money or oh, no. you don't. However, I have to put a comma in front of all say, since I said from the beginning, one of the major responsibilities of man, the reason we are given every man so, mm -hmm. is to prove bigger weight. It means that I am not, I don't want men who eat their wives' money and they are not producing anything. Mm -hmm. It should be embarrassing for somebody called a man not to feel embarrassed that they are not providing. Yes. However, provision does not mean bringing more money than your wife. It is true, you are supposed to be the main provider, yes. but you are having several streams. If, they, for example, you are earning a salary, then you invest. If the investment starts, investment starts bringing more income, you don't complain. True. So in the same way, although you're supposed to be the main provider, if God chooses to bless your family through your wife, it will still be okay. But you must be producing something. True. Don't sit idle. The problem is not whether you're bringing a lot. It's whether you're bringing anything at all. Yes. The Bible says, if you don't, um, if you don't, um, oh, if you don't work, yes, you don't eat. So when your wife gives you ugali and you have not worked in the day, say, darling, thank you very much for offering the ugali. But I don't want to eat it. <laughs> I don't want to go to hell. Because you see, the Bible is the one that has commanded not to eat yes. if you don't work. Yes. So it's important in this comma, as I am still dealing with my comma, yes. to find a way of providing. Mm -hmm. But I'm back to the relationship. Yes. If your wife does not see you just as a provider, but sees you as a friend, yes. as a father of her children, as um, her companion, yes. as her social support. Yes. Even when you bring no money, mm -hmm. she knows money cannot bring you these other things. That's true. She will still need you. Wow. And it's very important to understand that thirdly, I think it's in this so that you see how important it is God, is your children. Mm -hmm. Your children need to be taught early mm -hmm. that you actually are not the provider. Yes. God is the provider. Yes. He uses you is the pipeline to bring to the children. When the children learn that early, they see you as a vehicle to bring what God is giving. And even when God does not give through you, they're able to pray to God. Because they have learned that our Father is not the provider. Our Father is a vehicle for God's provisions. Mm -hmm. And that way, the family can do well with or without money. Wow, that is powerful. Because a lot of men are defined by money. And one of the reasons why a lot of men are depressed is because they don't have money. So, thank you so much. Um, I'd like us now to focus on you. And tell us about your journey. <laughs> Those 70 audience. No, you see, obviously, I need about seven hours. <laughs> you can. <laughs> one per, one per, per, per decade. <laughs> you can I, was born, I, was born, I was born 1952. Yes. And uh, emergency was declared almost around the same time. Yes. So my young age was dealing with Mau Mau. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you see Mau Mau. Sometimes you see home guards. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you see Jonas. Jonas were the white mm -hmm. young men mm -hmm. that came to fight Mau Mau. Yes. So that's how I grew up yes. as a young person. Yes. Violence mm -hmm. was normal nature. Mm -hmm. And um, at that time, I didn't know Jesus Christ. All I knew is, you pray to God, you still pray to God, but a personal relationship with God was not something that they dealt with. Mm. But I learned very early that because I'm a boy, my older sister, certain things were not expected of her, mm. they were expected of me. I'm not allowed to cry. How can you cry? You're a boy. 
which of course is wrong mm. in the sense that child should be allowed to cry. True. But that's how you that's how I grew up. Mm. Knowing men, there are certain expectations of men. Right. Even if you're a boy, you are not supposed to do certain things because only women are allowed to do those kind of things. Mm. And that's how I that's how I grew up in the 1950s right. into 1960s and then I went to school first in 1958. So from for the next 10 years I'm in primary school somewhere mm -hmm. or the other. Mm -hmm. Because I did my KP in 1967. Um, that's when I, I went to high school, mm -hmm. 60, 68. But I want to tell you the thing that happened is my transition from from primary, where you are you are in a you are a rural boy in a village. To go to high school brought a lot of changes. Right. Three of them. Number one, I discovered that young people can be serious with the God. Because mm -hmm. I joined a Christian union and they were serious with the God. Very serious with the God. Mm -hmm. And that was very important. Number two, I learned that people from all tribes, because now there are many people from different tribes, are not different from me. You know, when you grow up in a village, you start assuming the Luos, the Luyas are strangers. Yes. But you come to school and you realize you are just the same boys. Yes. Really, it doesn't, they, they may not speak your vernacular, but you speak in Swahili and English. You are seeing having the same needs and the same everything. And I think that has been very important for my masculinity to understand men are the same. There isn't, there isn't much of a difference mm -hmm. between, between them. Right. And that's something that I got in high school. And then, thirdly, it helped me to see that, because now I'm reading books, we had a very rich library. And uh, I'm able to see a book about Japan, a book about America, about, I started seeing the world as a village, mm -hmm. right, in the, the, right in 1968 by the kind of books that are, that are coming my way. Right. And it opened my mind to see myself as able to go anywhere in the world at a later stage. Mm -hmm. In other words, the books are opening your mind to see what could actually happen right. um, in the process. And those three things really helped me as I grew up, grew, I grew in high school, and then later to the, later to the university. Uh, because the school not only gave me the opportunity to grow, right in 1968, I was elected by my class mm. to present them in something. So, ah, so I can be a leader. Then, with, after some time, I was, of course, appointed a prefect. Hmm, okay, that's a, my from one to four school. Then I went for five and six, I was at Alliance. Again, I became a prefect, and I'm a leader in the Christian Union. Right. And that started saying, I'm not only a man who can lead my family, I also am a man who can lead other men. That, that started coming, coming open to me. So by the time I'm coming to university, again, within, within a short while, mm -hmm. I was elected in the Christian Union. And in 1975, I was, an, I was a chairman of the university criteria. No, at that time, you are not asked which university. Yes. There was only one. Yes. <laughs> there was only one university. Yes. So that gave me, gave me a bit. And I'm describing this in order to define, to define myself. Right. Um, so as I'm leaving university and then getting, getting married 44 years ago, I have already started. God has used that history to make who I am. And I can describe myself in four ways. Number one, I'm somebody who loves Jesus. Because that background allowed me to know that for me to live a life of fulfillment, I must be subject to the Lordship of Christ. That when I chose Jesus, it meant that he is interested in me enough to lead me on. And I decided I will no longer lead myself. I want Christ to lead me. And that defines me. Anytime, anything I've done since I left university 40 something years ago is on will this please the Lord? Somebody told me that at that early about being, you have a choice between being egocentric or Christocentric. Egocentric means your ego drives you yes. in making decisions. Christocentric means you sacrifice the ego and you allow Christ to be the one in control. So sometimes Christ will make you do things which you don't think are very good for your ego. 
It's embarrassing you. It's one, but you do it because you have chosen Christ to be the master. And number two, you have a feeling like he knows better than you. Not a feeling, it happens to be the truth. Yes. But that knowledge that he knows better than truth will allow you to do something embarrassing, which is really hurting your ego. Because you know God knows up front there's a need for this thing. But embarrassing it is. So one way of defining me is I'm Christocentric. I want God to control me and to lead me every step of the way. Number two, which is very, which has come out from that background, is I think I'm called, a, I could be called a leader. Mm. Not necessarily elected. I don't have to be elected, although I've been elected in many places. But I have a desire for God to use me for the good of the people around me. Mm. That's what makes you a leader. Mm. When you start doing this and doing that and doing the other for people, even if they don't elect you, mm. you they start looking up to you to bring solutions. And that, as a man, I believe that there are gifts God has given me that can help other men and that has answered society generally. So wherever I am, I'm likely to be doing something to help my community or to help whom I'm with. Wherever, right. whether appointed or not appointed, I have a desire to be a solution to the people around me. And that, that part, of my, part of my manhood, being a solution. Thirdly and importantly, I'm a family man. I'm very thankful to God for giving me a girl called Rebecca for the seven years ago. We've been married around for four years. Absolutely. And, uh, and uh, next to God, my, wife, my, 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 my life revolves around her. Because there's no way, once you are married, there's no way you can go alone. Because mm -hmm. you made a commitment, you vowed before man and God mm -hmm. that you are going to be together. And so it's been very, very, I've enjoyed my life in the last 44 years because we share. I have somebody to share with. I have somebody to bounce my ideas, my ideas on. Mm -hmm. And not just anybody, but a person who is interested in my welfare. Mm -hmm. Such that she cannot mislead me because if I get lost, you'll also be lost yes. since we are going together. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that I, I regard as very important, to be a family man is a very, very important one. In fact, I tell people, my priorities, which is everybody's priority, are always of God is number one priority. Rebecca is number two priority. Yes. My children yes. are number three priority. Yes. Everybody else becomes a distance for <laughs> However important the issue is, I must always put it, whether it's a professional yes. or a ministry thing I'm doing, I always ask, how does it fit in, in honoring God, in our marriage, with my children, then now <coughs> consider it, how does it fit in. Right. So that's who I am, yes. number three, so, so my family, I'm a family man. Okay. But now last, I'm a ministry man. Yes. I like to extend, I like to evangelize. And I like to disciple people yes. for Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. One final question. Yes. How do you think you learning or coming to Christ at an early age impacted your life? Oh, in a big, big way. I keep talking to people when I was, uh, I've gotten, I've gotten saved just in my, when I'm, when, when just about, about becoming a teenager, and then I, we are now in our 20s. Yes. I look back and I see the kind of messes they are talking about what they have gone through. A girl who got pregnant when he was a teenager, some systems, some things they did, they are sorry about. And I thank you, I'm grateful to God. That's why I like to encourage every young person to get to know the Lord early. Mm -hmm. Because if you get to know the Lord later, God will save you. Heaven will go. <laughs> but it's to be understood. God heals wounds. He's not a plastic surgeon. <laughs> the sky is the name. Wow, that is an amazing analogy. So, irrespective of what mess you did as a young person, mm. God will forgive it. Yes. You are certainly going to go to heaven. Mm. Guilt is removed. But if you are a child out of wedlock, yes. the child is a scar. Yes. 
you will still be there. Yes. Because God has forgiven you. Yes. But the wound is healed. Yes. No pain. Yes. But the scar remains. Yes. So you ask me, you ask me about the importance of getting saved young. Mm. It is the number of things God has protected me from. As I talk to my friends, now I talk to my friends who are grad, our grandparents, or many of us are grandparents, mm. and we talk about that history. And so I'm like, hey, man, man, are you not lucky? Why? And they start talking about the kind of message they have done. I'm grateful to God. So it really has yes. led me right. Yes. However, having said that, let's be clear. The people started working at nine, and the ones who work at five, mm. the parable says, they got the same reward. Yes. In heaven, yes. there's no difference. Because so God saved years, God saved young, but on earth, mm. it makes a difference. It does. Yes. Wow. Thank you so much, Mr. Dan. I think that is our time. I thank you so much for being with us. We look forward to our next show, Men Speak. God bless you. Shalom. And uh, have a lovely day.